بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد um, so we have quite a lot of material to cover today so let us jump straight in uh, so uh, today and inshallah next week we will do the actual details of the uh, the tragic death and the assassination of the third Khalifa Uthman ibn Affan رضي الله تعالى عنه and today we will begin talking about the actual reasons, the complaints that the people had, and the reasons for uh, the uh, the political fomentation happening in the time of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an. Now, in a nutshell, the assassination of Uthman uh, and the subsequent major battles that took place uh, after the death of Uthman, in reality, you can say that there's one very simplistic reason for this uh, occurrence. And that is that the social, political, and religious changes that enveloped the entire region were simply too swift. Too much was happening too fast. And there was bound to be some type of backlash, some type of negative consequences. You can call it like, let's say, growing pains. And we also have to realize that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explicitly predicted the trials between the companions. And in many authentic ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ speaking to the companions and saying things that are going to happen in their own lifetimes, he told them of a number of things to be careful of. He told them that fitan will come like the waves of the ocean. Trials will come like the waves of the ocean enveloping all of you. He told them that a time will come when the one who sits in his house and breaks his sword will be the best person. He told them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you in this world by your internal fighting so that in the next world you shall be forgiven. He said that my ummah is an ummah that is, mercy, that is shown mercy in the next life. All of its trials are in this life. So he mentioned that the ummah would have many trials and tribulations. And he warned the ummah of ignorant leaders that people, rabble, uh, riffraff, would be taken as leaders and would fight against the legitimate rulers. And he mentioned people whose speech would be beautiful, but whose actions would be harmful. They seem to be calling to something good, but in reality their actions are uh, nothing but evil. He mentioned to us in many a hadith that once the sword is unsheathed, it will never be put back in. Meaning once the civil war begins, the ummah will never be united. And indeed, the, as one of the Sahaba said, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, he said that the beginning of the fitna was the assassination of Uthman. And the end of the fitna will be the coming of Dajjal. So literally, Hudayfa, who is the one who knows trials the most, Hudayfa was the one who said, the first major fitna is the death of Uthman. There will be no ceasefire until the coming of Dajjal. Non-stop, trial after trial, until the coming of the Dajjal. And in particular, our Prophet Wasallam pointed towards the east. And he said, Al-fitnatu minha huna. The trials will come from there. And he said that that region is where the horns of shaitan come out from. And the east meaning al-mashriq, meaning uh, the lands basically of Iraq and the newly conquered uh, territories. And in fact, this is exactly where most of the trials came from. The, uh, the uh, deviant understandings of Islam, the groups that opposed the Sahaba, the groups that killed the Sahaba, the Khawarij, the uh, groups that cursed the Sahaba, uh, the groups that denied Qadr, the groups that denied Allah's names and attributes. <coughs> All of these groups are coming from that particular uh, region. And of course, these predictions have their causes that we can see in our own, if you like, material world. There are some detailed reasons as well why there is so much uh, trials happening during this time. And again, to summarize some of uh, these changes, uh, of the changes that is happening, of course, is the new conquest of Islam. Imagine this empire of Islam spreading across the world where peoples that were under the Roman or the Sassanid Empire all of a sudden are giving allegiance to a new religion, a new ethnicity, a new civilization. As well, the Arabs who were previously very, very poor, now the wealth is pouring in. 
and the Arabs had never known civilization. Now civilization is being imposed on them. The people who had no law or morality, all of a sudden have to have strict Islamic code. And we as Muslims born and raised in Islam find it difficult to follow the laws of Islam fully. Imagine those who were not raised in Islam and they were living the life of pleasure. And this is, as we have said many times, one of the problems arises that our perception is that everybody who converted is like Abu Bakr and Umar. But Abu Bakr and Umar were the exceptions. The majority of converts at that time were the converts of the conquests. They're converting because of political expediency. Not because Iman is coming in the heart. And that is why the Sahaba have the highest level. Those who converted at that time, most of them were not Sahaba. They didn't see the Prophet ﷺ. They're converting simply because the chieftain of their tribe has converted. So then they will all convert. Or they're converting for political reasons. And that's why when the Prophet ﷺ died, most of the further Muslims away had become murtad, as we know. Now imagine in the time of Abu Bakr and then Umar and then Uthman, all of these civilizations are conquered. Many of them embrace the faith. Even those that don't embrace the faith, they're not necessarily happy at status quo. And with the money coming in, the civilization changing, it is only natural that fault lines are going to grow. And it was during the uh, time, therefore, of Uthman, where the first earthquakes, the first, if you like, uh, signs began. And you can add to this as well, pre-Islamic jahili tendencies, tribalism. Remember that the Arabs were a tribal society. Islam came and attempted to solve that, but the reality was that people will remain people. And our Prophet wasallam said, four are the things from jahiliyyah, my ummah will never get rid of them. No matter how much, they will never be gotten rid of. And number one is tribalism, al fakhru bil ansab. Four are the things from jahiliyyah, my ummah will never get rid of them. And number one amongst them is what is now basically, we would call it nationalism, the pride of one's ancestry. Where you come from, where is your nation state, or in those days, where is the, uh, your, your tribe from. And realize that, much of the uh, problems that are coming are criticisms of the Quraysh and also in particular of the Banu Umayyah. So there is this sense of jealousy and one of the criticisms is that Uthman preferred the Banu Umayyah. That there is this sense of tribalism. Some have also uh, pointed out that uh, there was also a sense of greed amongst the new converts, those that were not Sahaba, when they saw the Sahaba being treated uh, financially in a very positive manner. Remember, when the money is coming in, uh, Umar uh, and Uthman continued this, gave Sahaba stipends according to their seniority. Now, imagine a person who's just converted in Iraq or in uh, Egypt or whatnot, and he doesn't have that stipend. He doesn't have that. And it's only natural there's going to be a resentment. Why should he get it? It's not in his mind that he is a Sahabi. They don't have that Iman. It's not in his mind that, oh, he was a Muslim from the beginning of the Meccan era, you have just converted after 40 years, there can be no comparison. In his mind, he will say, I am a chieftain, I am this, I am that. So a resentment at the levels of the Sahaba amongst the people who were not Sahaba. These are the new batch of people converting to the faith. And some analysts have also pointed out that there was a stark contrast between the strictness of Umar and the softness of Uthman. That the people took advantage of that. That Umar radiallahu an, we know how strict and authoritarian he was. And Uthman, his mizaj was exact opposite. And so some have pointed out that with that exact opposite, the softness and the gentleness, it's understood that some people are going to uh, basically find fault with, uh, with what's going on and use Uthman basically as a fake excuse, which is really the, the reality of what it is. That the criticisms that they had against Uthman were not legitimate. But what's happening is all of these factors, the social, the cultural, the religious, all of these factors is being manifested against criticisms of Uthman. Now before we begin the actual uh, criticisms, uh, the disclaimer, disclaimer that I've given in many, many lectures uh, before in the seerah many times, 
but especially in early Islamic history, that we cannot take uh, books of history at face value. We have to be a little bit more critical because what has happened is, well, firstly, every book of history is written at least three centuries or more after these incidents. So At-Tabari is written 310 Hijra. Ibn Kathir is coming 700. These are the two most authoritative. You have as well sectarian histories. Histories written by other groups, non-Sunni groups. And this early period of Islamic history is read in theological lenses. You cannot be neutral. We are Sunnis. We will view everything from a Sunni light. Others are Shia, they will view everything from a Shia light. Our biases have to be known. And there is nobody who is totally unbiased. I have a bias. That bias is the Sahaba are good people. It's a bias. Where do I get this bias from? Allah says so. Radiallahu anhum wa an. So I have a presumption. That presumption is the Sahaba are good people. A person who doesn't believe in Allah and His Messenger will not have that bias, will they? They will say, my bias is that you can have good and you can have bad. And if so-and-so was evil and they'll mention some of the Sahaba, that's possible. In their minds, this is being fair and neutral. In the minds of the Shia, Abu Bakr can never be righteous. Umar can never be righteous. They have their bias. So once you study a little bit, you'll understand nobody can be 100% unbiased. Everybody has presumptions. The question is, do you know your presumptions and recognize them? And we recognize our presumptions. Of those presumptions is that it is simply not possible that those who believed in the Prophet in early Islam, and especially the Ashra Mubashara, and especially in this particular incident, Uthman ibn Affan was guilty of a major sin. It's not possible. After all the ahadith, after all of the verses of the Quran, after the Prophet himself saying multiple times, it doesn't matter what Uthman does after today, he has been forgiven. We take these ahadith and we form our understanding of Uthman based upon them. And other groups, the Shia groups for example, will have their interpretations. For them, Uthman is not a righteous person from the beginning. So they will interpret according to their uh, understanding. As well, they have their versions of history. If we have a tabari they have their versions written after a tabari And uh, typically speaking, their chains of narration are almost non-existent. And the versions in those books at times is radically different than the versions in our books. So we cannot just find any book and open it up and say, oh, it says in this book. Doesn't matter what the book says. We have to be a little bit more uh, critical and use our sounder methodology. What is our methodology? Well, alhamdulillah for us as Sunni Muslims, we have the concept of isnad. Isnad is, what is the isnad? The chain of narrators. We have the chain of narrators. And for us as Sunni Muslims, we look at every report through that chain. And we verify, is it an authentic chain or not? Now this is great for most of the reports. The problem comes that much of early history is reported without Isnad. Because that's the nature of early history. And we mentioned this in the Seerah many times. Even in the Seerah, how much do we actually know uh, of, of so many incidents? We just have bits and pieces here and there. How much is actually going to be recorded? And one final disclaimer before we actually begin, and that is uh, the methodology of Sunni Islam when it comes to these early uh, problems is that anything that concerns the Sahaba, we gloss over and don't go too deep over. We simply let it be. And especially when we get to Ali radiallahu anhu. Right now it's between Uthman and the rebels. There is no Sahabi who participated in the killing of Uthman. So we can go a little bit deeper. Today we will go a little bit deeper. But when we get to the next year and the fitan of Ali radiallahu anhu and the time of Ali radiallahu anhu, the methodology of Ahl sunnah is to skim over and not go deep. As Imam Ahmad famously remarked when he was asked about the fitna between the Sahaba, he said, that was a time frame Allah saved us from having to unsheathe our swords. So, alhamdulillah, we weren't there. Now, let us save ourselves by sheathing our tongues, by controlling our tongues. 
Okay, this is the pr main philosophy of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. What happened, happened. There's no benefit to go into detail. He said this, she said that. What happened here? Because in reality, we respect both sides when it comes to the, the time of Ali radiallahu anhu. Not the time of Uthman. The time of Uthman, obviously, it's much easier because the other side is not Sahaba. The other side is rebels trying to kill him. But when we get to the next generation, we'll go much more gentler. And the fact of the matter, I'm telling you from now, we will not go deep reports because there's simply no benefit at all. It's like a very bitter argument you've had with a loved one. Okay. Now that the argument is over, who benefits to go back and say, oh, you said this, she said that, he said, who benefits? Khalas is over, done deal, move on. It's better for everybody concerned. And that's our philosophy. We love both sides. We love Aisha radiallahu anhu. We love Talha. We love uh, Abdurrahman ibn Auf. We love uh, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu. We love every one of them. So we keep our tongues quiet. As for Uthman, it's a bit easier because the other side is not uh, Sahabi. So let us begin. Today, inshallah ta'ala, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over all of the complaints, inshallah, as exhaustive as I can that they had against Uthman, all of them. And then next week, we'll go over the actual details of them entering the house and killing him and whatnot that we know, okay? So today we will talk about the complaints that the uh, rebels had against Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala an. And these complaints were presented to him in the year 35 AH. In the year 35 AH, when a group of, of these rebels left Egypt and decided to basically perform Umrah and uh, eventually the Hajj of that year. Remember when you performed Hajj, it's not like us. We'd go one day before, get to Mecca, then we go for Hajj. We'd come one day after that. In those days, Hajj was like a three, four month event. You would go, you would camp out, you would wait for the Hajj season, and then you'd come back. So a group of, of these rebels basically decides to perform uh, 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 Umrah and then Hajj and also to march to Medina and demand from Uthman certain uh, changes. And in particular, by the way, one of the main issues that Uthman always had to deal with was complaints against governors, especially in Kufa. He had to change governors at least four times. Every year or so, some type of weird complaint. Uh, the governor is doing this, the governor is doing that, and the people would complain. They're not happy. Why are they not happy? Because the governor is enforcing Allah's law on them, and they don't like that law. That's in essence, with it, the gist of it is, too much is happening, and they just don't like it. So they find this fault so much. I mean, one, one ridiculous example, and I'm not going to go into that much detail, but, but a, a well-known example, they even accused Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, of not knowing how to pray Salah properly. A group of new Muslims who had never seen the Prophet are accusing Sa'ad that he doesn't even know how to pray Salah. That's in the letter to Uthman. So imagine this is the mentality that they simply want to get rid of the status quo and to put themselves in charge. Wealth is coming in, but they're not getting it. Power is there, but they don't have it. So they're complaining. They're finding all of these faults to complain. So eventually, uh, in the uh, 35 uh, AH, in the month of uh, Dhul Hijjah, they gather outside of Medina and they begin to send uh, basically delegations until finally they have a long list of complaints. And these are the complaints we will do. Now, alhamdulillah, four or five of them we have already discussed in a lot of detail. So we'll just mention, and I don't have to discuss them, okay? Number one, we already discussed. The burning of the Mus'hafs. Okay? So one of the complaints, Uthman burnt the Mus'hafs. We already discussed that. We explained what is the correct understanding. This was the saving of the Qur'an. That Allah Azza wa Jal preserved the sanctity of the Qur'an through the wisdom of Uthman. Radiallahu ta'ala an. And that is why, alhamdulillah, even the groups that don't like Uthman use the script of Uthman in the Qur'an. We thank Allah. There are no two Qur'ans in the Ummah. We thank Allah. There's no king this version and Khalifa that version. No. We have one Qur'an and that is the Uthmani script preserved because of the wisdom of Uthman ibn Affan. That's the first one. But that was the complaint that he ordered us to burn our copies of the Qur'an and he kept a copy for himself. Now you will see every complaint, it has a kernel of truth. 
but you read in evil meanings and incorrect interpretations. Every complaint. And subhanAllah, this shows you when you have a diseased heart, you can take the best of things and read evil into them. And this is a sign for all of us, wallahi all of us. When you have a pure heart, a good heart, you will make excuses for a mistake. But when you have an evil heart, you will find mistakes when there is no need for any excuse. Wallahi, this is, we see this in Uthman radiallahu anhu. Honestly, sinless in all of these accusations. To the very end. But there is this kernel of truth and then misinterpreted, twisted upside down. Number two, the issue of exiling Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, that was last week. Went over it in detail, okay? Exiling Abu Dhar al-Ghifari never happened the way that they did it. Number three, he didn't participate in Badr. So he shouldn't be a Khalifa, right? And again, who are these people? And again, every one of these complaints, who do you think you are to bring these complaints to Uthman? What right do you have as nobodies to bring, to tell to Uthman that he didn't participate at Badr? You didn't even see the Prophet ﷺ, much less do anything in his lifetime. But again, this is a part of that. So we talked about that. And we say that in fact, it is considered that Uthman participated at Badr. He is considered a Badri. And how do we know this? What's the evidence? The Ghanima, the booty. The Prophet ﷺ gave him a qism of the booty which demonstrates he is counted as a Badri. Number four, you fled in the battle of Uhud. So this is a criticism. And Uthman himself defended and the Sahaba defended that Allah forgave. Who are you to, who are you to reproach? Right? Literally Allah says in the Quran explicitly and Allah has forgiven them. A mistake happened. And you were not there at that time and place. You did not know the panic and the chaos. And Allah Himself says, you are forgiven. So, that was the fourth point. The fifth is, of course, the most bizarre in my opinion, that you didn't participate in the Bay'atul Ridwan. And that is so ludicrous, right? You didn't participate in the Bay'atul Ridwan. And Bay'atul Ridwan took place to defend Uthman. And not only that, but the Prophet's left hand was Uthman ibn Affan. How can you criticize Uthman? The Prophet's left hand was put in his own right hand and he said, this is on behalf of Uthman and our scholars say, this is the highest honor that Uthman was given. That the Prophet took his own hand and he acted as if it was the hand of Uthman ibn Affan and he said, if Uthman were here, this is what he would have done. Okay, so this is also um, the, the, the point to be mute. So these five we've already covered in a lot of detail. Let's get to the sixth point that we haven't covered now. The sixth point, they said that Uthman had prevented the people of Medina from using public pastures for their animals. So this is called in Arabic the issue of, uh, of Al-Hima. And Al-Hima is a land that has been protected, you can't go there. And they said you have no right to acquire land and deprive the Muslims of using that land for their animals. And a uh, technical point, and Uthman ibn Affan had in fact taken some lands outside of Medina. They say where Masjid al-Ghimama is today. Uh, they had, he had taken some lands outside Medina and he had forbidden the people of Medina to take their animals to that land. And he responded and explained, as for the issue of al-Hima, it was first begun by Umar ibn al-Khattab when he demarcated certain lands for the camels of sadaqa and jihad. That the camels that are owned by the state for sadaqa, for the orphans, for fighting, he allocated for them a certain land. That this is for the camels owned by the state. And he said, in my time, the animals increased a large quantity so I had to increase the land. And he said, O oh people, this land is not for my personal animals. I only own two camels that I use for the Hajj and for the Jihad. This land is for the camels of Sadaqah and of Jihad for the armies. So in other words, the land that he had made private and forbidden local Muslims from grazing there was used by the camels of the state 
Simple. There's no, he's not acquiring it for himself. And that was the response to uh, that, okay? So number six basically is the acquiring of land, but he said this is not for me, it is for the state. Number seven, that they criticized him for performing dhuhr in hajj, in mina, four rak'at instead of two. And again, think about it, so what if he did? What has that got to do with you marching from Basra and from Iraq and petitioning and demanding that he resign? Because that was their point, you have to resign. Because you prayed dhuhr for rak'at. Now, what is the story here? So, for those of you that have done hajj, you should know that the hujjaj, they pray two rak'at in Mina. Okay, they pray two rak'at. And that is the sunnah of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar. Uh, Uthman radiallahu an, um, during one of his years, he switched over from praying two to four. And he began praying four for the last few years of his life. Now, why did he do this fuqaha? to this day are scratching their heads, trying to find a reason. Some say this, some say that. Uthman ibn Affan himself, it is reported, he said that I have taken Mecca as a home, so I cannot pray Qasr in Mecca. And some scholars have said maybe he purchased some property in Mecca, maybe uh, he married from a, one of the women in Mecca. Whatever, we don't understand. For some reason, he interpreted himself as not being Musafir. Whatever his ijtihad, right? Most of the scholars of fiqh disagreed with Uthman's opinion and they said even if you're musafir, the hujjaj, sorry, even if you're Makkawi, even if you're from Mecca, the hujjaj pray two rak'at. In Arafat, in, in Muzdalifah, they pray two rak'at as a rukhsa for even the person from Mecca. Okay? This is the position of the vast majority of fuqaha. Still, Uthman made an ijtihad. What has this got to do with you guys complaining and telling he needs to leave? So Uthman explained himself and he said that I consider myself a muqeem of Mecca. Why? We don't quite understand. Why? Most likely he had purchased property. But still, again, what has this got to do with the complaints? That's another issue which is irrelevant. Number eight. Number eight. Of the criticisms they said is that you have brought back out of exile somebody whom the Prophet ﷺ exiled because he happens to be your uncle. So this story requires a little bit of explanation. One of the uncles of Uthman, his name was Al-Hakam ibn Abil As, his father's brother, Uthman ibn Affan ibn Abil As. So Al-Hakam ibn Abil As is his actual blood uncle, father's brother. And Al-Hakam's son was to play one of the most important roles in Islamic history. And that was Al-Hakam's son. Al-Hakam's son. Marwan ibn Al-Hakam. Marwan ibn Al-Hakam. Who is Marwan ibn Al-Hakam? Marwan ibn Al-Hakam, eventually, be, right now he's the secretary of Uthman. Then he's going to become the governor then he is going to become the Khalifa of the Muslim Ummah. Another, what is it now, 30 years down the line? He is going to become, no, 20 years down the line, 20, 22 years down the line. Marwan ibn al-Hakam will become the Khalifa of the Ummah. And Marwan ibn al-Hakam is the father of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And Abdul Malik ibn Marwan had four Khulafa as sons, one after the other. The only Khalifa in our history who had four sons Khulafa, and in between was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. In between that, right? So this is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan ibn al-Hakam. By the way, so what happened? Muawiyah, of course, is the founder. Muawiyah's son is Yazid. Yazid dies, Yazid has a son, Muawiyah. Ibn Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Muawiyah was 19 years old, the, the grandson of Muawiyah. Muawiyah was very young and very sick and he dies within a year or two. And he doesn't have a son. So after Muawiyah's grandson, Muawiyah, dies, Marwan, the cousin of Uthman, becomes the Khalifa. And all of the Khulafa of the Umayyads come from the line of Marwan. 
other than Muawiyah and Yazid and Muawiyah. The rest of the Umayyads are not from Muawiyah's lineage. They're from Banu Umayyah, because again, Muawiyah and uh, Marwan are second cousins. So they're from the Banu Umayyah, but they're not from the line of Muawiyah. They're the, from the line of Marwan. This Marwan, this is the Marwan. So Marwan's father is Uthman's uncle. No, uncle. Marwan is the cousin of Uthman. Mar first cousin. Marwan's father is the uncle of Uthman. Now, according to some books of history, when the Prophet conquered Mecca, some of the bitter enemies of Islam were asked to leave Mecca and settle in Ta'if. And of them was Al-Hakam ibn Abil As. Of them was Al-Hakam ibn Abil As. Now, it is unclear what happens to Al-Hakam. According to one report, he eventually is allowed to return to Mecca. And according to another, he remains in exile, uh, basically, uh, from uh, Mecca. Now, um, Ibn Taymiyyah responds to this allegation that how can Uthman have brought Al-Hakam back? And Ibn Taymiyyah says that firstly, the whole story of Al-Hakam being sent to Ta'if in exile is not something that any book of hadith reports. It's something that is simply found in the myths and the fables of later uh, historians and Allah knows if it's true or not. We don't know. Secondly, he said, that even if he was sent into exile, he was sent to Ta'if. That has nothing to do with Medina. And Uthman tells him to come to Medina. Has nothing to do with Medina. Thirdly, even if he was sent into exile, this does not imply that the exile cannot be rescinded at a later date. You send a person into exile for a year, for a two, for five. Uthman, as the leader, does have the right to rescind the exile. So even if he brings him back, that is his right and not any problem in that. And then fourthly, Marwan in all of this exile is sinless. That's his father. And Marwan only left Mecca. Now by the way, is Marwan a Sahabi or not? Marwan is considered to be a special category of Sahaba. Those who saw the Prophet as a child. So Marwan is a young boy at the time of the conquest of Mecca. He must have seen the Prophet ﷺ, but he's not interacted with him. Okay, he's probably five, six years old, and he sees the Prophet ﷺ, but he doesn't actually interact with him. So, this is a category of Sahaba that, yes, technically, he is a type of Sahabi, but he's not the type that has basically narrated from the Prophet ﷺ or interacted with him. Marwan has not reported any hadith. He's not somebody who's interacted with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even if his father was sent into exile, what has this got to do with um, Marwan? And uh, Al-Qadi ibn al-Arabi of Andalusia remarks that Marwan is an upright man in the eyes of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un. All of them considered Marwan to be a great leader and a good uh, caliph. And the only people who criticize him are the foolish of some of the historians and, and poets. They, don't, they just want to basically criticize every single uh, uh, politician. So um, the bottom line, this issue of bringing Al-Hakam back and Marwan back, again, it's a very, very, not really a criticism. He has the right as the Khalifa to after 20 or now 27 years have gone by, so if he decides to bring Marwan from Ta'if to Medina, what has that got to do with the fact that he was told to leave Mecca? If this is true. And also, what has that got to do with Marwan? Even that would have been Al-Hakam, not Marwan. Okay, so this is the next point of criticism. Now, one of the more complicated stories, which I kind of left till today, is another criticism involving a Sahabi. And that is Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir and Uthman ibn Affan. This is another big story. Like Abu Dhar and Uthman. Anhum. And I will not go into that level of detail as I went into Abu Dhar. But in a nutshell, uh, this is one of those stories where once again you find various narratives amongst Sunnis and Shia that are really contradictory to one another. Okay. Now, remember, Ammar ibn Yasir 
for the Shia, he's one of the Arkan. Who are the Arkan? Remember, what's the Arkan? There are four Sahaba who are considered to be supporters of Al Al Bayt. Okay? And Abu Dhar is one of them, and Salman al Farsi is one of them, and Ammar is one of them. So, from the perspective of the Shia, Ammar is loyal to Al Al Bayt, so he is, they call him Arkan, we call them Sahaba. For us, for, for us all Sahaba are Sahaba, for them there's only four. And Ammar is one of them. So they have a version of events where this is all exaggerated. The tensions between Ammar and Uthman. And we have a version of events where some minor things happen, just like with Abu Dhar. And the other group has really blown it out of proportion. So what is our, uh, what is our standard narrative? And again, the problem comes, unfortunately, too often in Sunni trends, you have those later historians and later analysts who try to sugarcoat everything. And they try to pretend as if nothing happened. And in my opinion, this actually causes more problems. That you will find many people say, oh, there was no tension between Ammar and Uthman radiallahu anhu. And this causes more problems because al Dhahabi, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Taymiyyah, they all mention these tensions. But what happens is, as you go further and further away, you get these people who want to just sugarcoat, make sure there's no issue. So that, and, and they want to present a very rosy narrative. But when you do that, all you have to do is go back to the books and realize there was something going on. So what is the uh, kernel of truth? Well, in a nutshell, it appears that Ammar ibn Yasir, now of course Ammar ibn Yasir, who is Ammar ibn Yasir? His father and mother were the first martyrs, right? And Ammar himself was around 16, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ consoled him and told him, don't worry, you can uh, say words of kufr if they punish you. Remember, they were punishing him, the Quraysh. And, uh, and he came crying to the Prophet and he said, I, I was forced to say things that I, I didn't want to say. And Allah revealed in the Quran that if you say things when you are forced, then um, no problem, Allah will forgive you. So this is Ammar. Ammar has proven himself. He's one of the greatest Sahaba. And many a hadith about him. When we get to Ammar ibn Yasir, we'll talk about uh, the hadith about Ammar ibn Yasir. So, Ammar radiallahu an did seem to have some criticisms of Uthman's policies. And it is allowed to disagree with the Sahaba on their policies. It's nothing wrong with that. The Sahaba, we don't say anything about their intentions. We don't criticize their loyalty to Allah and His Messenger. But we do not have to agree with their ijtihad about how to run the government, about who to appoint, about their politics, their economics. We don't have to agree. And we can say, oh, well, that was their ijtihad, and there are others as well. And especially Ammar himself, he has the right to disagree. As a, as a person of the society, as an upright member, as a person who goes back to the beginning of Islam, he has a right to disagree. And he had some complaints about Uthman's policies. And it is said in um, some of our books that Ammar took with him uh, another Sahabi, uh, Sa'ad most likely Ibn Abi Waqqas, and he said, come let us present our complaints to Amir al-Mu'mineen. Come let us go and present what we have, complaints to Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is before the uh, rebels are outside, this is way before, this is a few years before. Okay, this is when things are calm in Medina. So they go to the house of Uthman, but the guards are standing outside, or the, not, you call them the bawab, the people that are basically the gatekeepers, whoever is going to be, you know, you can't just walk in to the house of the Khalifa, you have to have protection. So you have the, whatever, the secretaries, or the, not the secretaries, you have the guards, the, the, the doorkeepers, whatever they are. And they say, go tell him that Sa'ad and Ammar are at the door. They go inside, and Uthman ibn Affan sends the message, not now, tell them to come at that time, and we'll have the discussion then. Whatever, he was the busy at the time, he said, we'll have another meeting with them. So the guards go and tell Sa'ad and Ammar that not now, come back at this time. Sa'ad leaves, Ammar radiallahu an insists, no, tell him to come right now. I want to meet him right now. And the guard says, he has said no, it's not going to happen now. Come back in this time and place. And tempers rise, voices are raised until the guard takes out his stick and hits Ammar to leave. And of course, this is a big blunder. Who are you, O oh guard, to hit Ammar? Who is Ammar and who are you? This was a big blunder. And 
this was a mistake and there is no question that the gatekeeper or the guard went beyond what he should have done. This incident, which has been narrated in our books, if you look at the equivalence in Shia histories, you will be amazed. The references in those books are that Ammar was whipped and tortured by the guards of Uthman. That Ammar's entrails and intestines were on the floor out of the whipping. That he fell into a coma for days because of this brutal whipping. And the reality is nothing like this happened. There was a kernel of tension and that tension was indeed the result of complaints that Ammar had. And those complaints, unfortunately, a beat was had on the back of Ammar. And when the complaints came back to Uthman from the rebels, and they complained that you have mistreated Ammar, what did Uthman ibn Affan say? He said, that was something my guards did without my command, nor even my pleasure. I never wanted them to do this. And if Ammar insists, here is my back, I give it to him for Qisas. Like, you can hit me as well. That you're right, I, that was not, should not have happened. And if Ammar wants his right back, even though I didn't command it, even though I'm not happy at it, but if Ammar insists, here's my back, tell him. I mean, who are you to complain on behalf of Ammar? Right? And Ammar obviously did not want that to happen. And in fact, and this is, here's the point here, that I think if you're honest, it's always the best. When you look at our books of history, there's no question, in my opinion, that Ammar radiallahu an had some points of criticism about Uthman's policies. But Ammar had nothing to do with the rebels. I mean, I can disagree with you without wanting to harm you. Right? I can disagree with some of your policies without wanting you to be killed. And when the rebels surrounded the house of Uthman, Ammar was of those who criticized the rebels. And in fact, it is narrated that at the end of the siege, as we'll come to next week, inshallah, at the end of the siege, when the rebels cut off even water being delivered to the house of Uthman, I will explain the story and why and how and why did nobody intervene. That will be next week, inshallah ta'ala. When the rebels cut off water being delivered, it was Ammar who stood up in the masjid and said, this was a man who purchased bi'ir ruma for the sahaba to drink water from. And now you stop him from getting a glass of water. So it was Ammar who criticized the rebels for laying the siege to Uthman. How then can you flip it around as the other group does and claim that Ammar was on the side of the rebels? So honesty is the best policy. Yes, there were some slight tensions between Ammar and Uthman. But Ammar never rejected the Khilafah of Uthman. You don't have to agree with every policy. You have the right to criticize, right? How many of us, we might even like a particular person, but uh, we don't agree with each and everything that he does. This is human nature, isn't it? You don't have to agree with everything. And sometimes you might even raise your voices. Abu Bakr and Umar had their minor issues between each other, as I mentioned. But in the end of the day, they were friends and they were helpers of one another. So here is one of those things that happen. And again, the other side makes it into such a big issue and the whole narrative is created that really is completely um, exaggerated. Uh, the 10th point we're on, the 10th point we're on, that he said, or they said to Uthman, they said to Uthman ibn Affan, that you promised one of your relatives 4% of the booty of all of Egypt. That's a huge amount. You promised one of your relatives, and his name was Abdullah uh, ibn Abi Sarah, 4% of all of the booty of all of Egypt. What is 4%? Is khumus al khumus. One fifth of one fifth. So one twenty fifth, which is 4%. Okay? We have a concept of percentages, they had a concept of fractions. They didn't say percents. We, we use percents, our minds use percents. For them it was fractions, one eighth, one seventh, one fifth, and one fifth, right? And even the Quran, inheritance is in fractions, not percentages. So they have a different way of looking at numbers, we have a different way of looking at numbers. So the accusation was, you promised your relative 4%. And the response, this is something Allah allows. What is it? In the Quran, so who was this relative? He was the commander of the 
second conquest of Egypt. The first conquest is Amr in the time of Umar. The second conquest which took place beyond Egypt was under Uthman's reign. And the commander was this very Abdullah. And in the law of Islam, according to the Quran, one-fifth of one-fifth of the Ghanima goes to the Khalifa. Okay? One-fifth of one-fifth. And Uthman gave his share to the commander as an incentive to win the war. There's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. It's his share. He has the right. And Uthman said, if you victorious, the Khumus al Khumus is yours. And the rebels then say, you are preferentially treating your relatives. You see where, again, this notion is coming from. Complete exaggeration out of a kernel of truth. This was a legitimate share that Uthman should earn himself. And rather than taking it himself, he gave it to the commander. This is the commander of the army as an incentive. And guess what? It worked. The commander won. And because of that, alhamdulillah, Egypt and what is beyond is Muslim land. So again, nothing is wrong with this whatsoever. Now we get to the 11th point of criticism. And this is really the most awkward and the most difficult one. And it is also the most famous point of criticism that all of you have heard. And unfortunately, many people believe. But you have already seen the previous 10 points, how ludicrous they were. Why is it then that we don't have the same skepticism for the 11th point? What is the 11th point? What is the main criticism against Uthman? Who can tell me? Nepotism. Nepotism. Okay? This is the main criticism that to this day is in the minds even of many Sunni Muslims. And subhanAllah, we have just gone over 10 points. Each one we have shown how false, how shallow it was. Why is it then that we are not skeptical of the 11th point? Really, it surprises me how easy some Muslims fall prey to this and say, yes, Uthman was guilty of nepotism. The one whom the angels are shy of will not be guilty of any dhulm. And we will talk about this right now. Now, so the 11th point of criticism is you prefer your relatives over us. And that was a criticism that the rebels had. You prefer your relatives over us. You appoint your family and the Banu Umayya and you give them preferential treatment. Now, once again, there's a kernel of truth, right? That's the whole point. There's a kernel of truth and the response is that it's a little bit more complicated than this. Now, realize that the previous two Khalifas, Abu Bakr and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, which tribe is Abu Bakr from? Banu? Banu Taim, very good. Which tribe is Umar from? Banu Adi. Okay. The tribe, the sub-tribes, obviously they're all Qurashi. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, all Qurashi. The Banu Taim and the Banu Adi were literally less than the fingers of one hand. Just a few. And the fact of the matter is that there really were no major Sahaba from those sub-tribes to have been appointed anywhere. Of the Quraysh, there were two large tribes. The Banu Hashim and the Banu Umayyah. These were the only two tribes that actually had a few dozen people in them, the two sub-tribes. How many sons did Abdul Muttalib have? Remember, right? More than 10. 10 was what he promised Allah, if you give me 10, I'll, I'll sacrifice one. He had more than 10 sons. And Umayyah's children as well proliferated. So from a purely statistical perspective, you have more people from the Banu Umayyah anyway than from the other sub-tribes. And another point, therefore, is that you cannot ignore the fact that the quantity of people from the Banu Umayyah is significantly larger than that of many of the other sub-tribes of the Quraysh. As well, if you look at the number of uh, the names of the appointees of Uthman ibn Affan, you will see that in reality he appointed Ansar, he appointed non-Qurashis, 
He appointed Qurayshis from other than Banu Umayyah. And yes, he appointed some from the Banu Umayyah as well. Simple reading of the lists of governors. Simple reading of the list of appointees of Uthman will disqualify the notion that there was blatant preferential treatment. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an did not appoint the majority of posts from his kith and kin. There's no question about this. All you need to do is to look at the names of the uh, appointees. However, since the number of people from Banu Umayyah is more than from other tribes, and since they are indeed from the Quraysh, yes, it is true that we have a small yet not insignificant percentage of appointees from the Banu Umayyah. Is it statistically more than what would have happened anyway? We don't know because how many were non Qurashi? How many? We don't know. We really don't know. But in the end of the day, it is clear that there is no blatant, clear-cut nepotism. It's not as if all other positions are being blocked and only the Banu Umayyah are being given this position. But it is true that some of his cousins and some of his relatives were given positions of responsibility. There's no denying this. And a simple example here is his cousin Marwan. His cousin Marwan, who is 40 years his junior, 30 years his junior, actually more than 40, 40 years his junior, his cousin Marwan is appointed his katib. And the katib here, in, in essence, it means his personal vizier, his personal secretary, okay? The one who really micromanages, the one who's, you know, everybody has like a right-hand man. And Marwan became that right-hand man. And a few other cases, a cousin here or something there, that some position is uh, given. But here is the question. Is it wrong for Uthman to appoint a cousin to be his most trusted advisor? Think about it. Is it wrong? Who do you trust the most in a world of tribalism? Who is the one that you're really going to assign your inner secrets to? Family. So the flip side is, who else will you trust? Other than the people that are already loyal to you anyway. Especially when it comes to the sensitive era of early Islam. And so, when we clearly look at the names of appointees and we say that there's a healthy mix, you have non-Arabs, Mawali, you have Ansar, you have non-Qurashi, you have non-Umayyad Qurashi, and yes, you have not an insignificant few who are Banu Umayyah. But what this shows, blatant nepotism, no. Okay, is there indiscreet nepotism? The question is, what exactly is indiscreet nepotism? So what if he chooses his cousin over a stranger? In fact, it makes sense to choose a cousin over a stranger when it comes to such matters. So what if there's a generic position that anybody can do and he chooses people that he knows since he was a child? Somebody has to do a task. He sends a second cousin, go do this task and come back. In the end of the day, there's leeway given. And to read in nepotism is simply too harsh of a judgment. Especially when it is coming from that group of critics. And especially when we see the other criticisms, how shallow they were. And that is why it is authentically uh, reported in one narration, <clears throat> Uthman said, that as for your accusation that I love my relatives, this has not caused me to do dhulm unto others. Meaning, of course, I love my relatives, but I haven't taken that love to do dhulm unto others. Rather, I gave them responsibilities and I called them to task for those responsibilities. Meaning, I'm going to make sure they do what I tell them to do, like I, like I do to any other position. And as for your accusation that I've given money to them, because they said you have given Marwan this much, you've given Marwan this that much. He said, this is from my personal money and not from the Islamic treasury, for the money of the treasury is not allowed for me to take. It is 100% true that Uthman gave his family members sometimes large amounts of money. But why should he not give his own money to his own family? The accusation was you are giving large amounts of money to your family. The response was, so what? It's my money. 
It's not the state's money. It's money that Uthman has earned as a trader. It's money that he's already, as we know, Uthman was a person who Allah had blessed with lots of money, of the richest of the Sahaba, through buying and selling, through trading. And he was generous. In one version he says, I who was generous throughout the time of Abu Bakr and Umar Uthman, I who was generous as a young man, now you want me not to be generous when I'm close to death? In other words, what, do you want me to be stingy with my money, not give charity? So the accusation that he was generous to his relatives, it's true. He was generous, but that was from his own wealth. The accusation that he was practicing nepotism or guilty of nepotism, a very, very gray area. And we say, as for blatant nepotism, no, wallahi no. As for soft nepotism, all of us are guilty of it. We prefer our friends and our relatives for neutral positions. What he himself said, my love for my family did not cause me to do dhulm to any. It's not as if somebody was qualified, I denied the job. There's an open slot, open position, and if I give somebody that I know, there's nothing wrong, and I hold him to account. He says this, I hold him to account, I require from him the same job and responsibility as, uh, as others as well. And in fact, in one uh, hadith uh, reported in, in uh, not hadith, but in, reported in, in Musa Imam Ahmed, he actually has an interesting statement, and he said that, I ask you by Allah, didn't the Prophet Sallallahu prefer the Quraysh over all the other people? And didn't he prefer the Banu Hashim over the rest of the Quraysh? Didn't he love the Quraysh and prefer the Quraysh over the other people? And the people couldn't say anything to that. So he said, if the keys of Jannah were to be handed to me, I would distribute it to the Banu Umayyah until all of them entered Jannah. Now, what is the meaning of this? It's very simple. If you could choose who gets to go to Jannah, who's going to be your first choice? Your family. What's wrong with that? That's what he's trying to say. What is wrong if the opportunity is for everybody? Why is it wrong that I prefer my family as long as I'm not doing dhulm to other people? And this is the key point. That Uthman radiallahu an did not take away the rights of anybody. If he had done so, this would be dhulm. And if he had done so, this would be nepotism. But it is true for some positions and posts, and definitely not for the majority, he gave them to cousins, distant relatives, and for this he was accused of uh, nepotism, and we said that that is simply a false um, accusation. Uh, to conclude, I have quoted 11 criticisms. 11 criticisms. There are one or two more that are more minor than this. If you really want to assess the strength of these criticisms, sim uh, simply look at each one of them. And you will see, wallahi, not a single one is worthy of merit. Not a single one is standing on its own two feet. Rather, every one of them, and that is why if you're in doubt about the 11th one, which is nepotism, look at the other 10. All the other 10, for sure, we see, have that kernel of truth, which is then twisted, turned upside down, put into misinterpreted facts, and then spread as some type of lie. And the same goes for the 11th one as well. And the fact of the matter is that these rebels were not in reality serious about these accusations. Rather, they have other grievances. And those grievances go back to money and power. Those grievances go back to greed. It's as simple as that. And they wanted Uthman to step down so that they could in effect take over and get a share of the pie. We have explained so many times the amount of money pouring in and the power of the ummah. And these people have been deprived of it. And so they should be deprived. They're not worthy of it. But they are not happy at status quo. So they have all of these flimsy excuses and eventually they uh, march to Medina. Now, uh, next week, inshallah, we'll summarize uh, the actual details. Uthman managed to answer each and every one of their excuses. He gave a khutbah in the masjid, and he answered every one of their excuses, sometimes by quoting a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. And they had no excuse left. So they gathered their resolve to basically leave Medina and go back to 
uh, to Egypt, but that is when they discovered this mysterious letter. And that's where we're going to come to next week. And in it, allegedly, the letter said that when this group returns to Egypt, kill all of them. Okay? And apparently, that was the spark that they came back to Medina and surrounded the house of Uthman. And one thing led to another until it led to the killing of Uthman ibn Affan. What was the letter? Where did it come from? What is the story of that? And the details of the surrounding of the house. And why did nobody fight these people? Why did nobody defend Uthman? All of this, inshaAllah ta'ala, uh, will be next uh, Wednesday, inshaAllah, when we talk about the, the final days of Uthman. And then, inshaAllah, the Wednesday after that, we will do the ahadith narrated by Uthman, as I've been doing every, every time, right? Inshallah, I'll choose, there are too many to do all. I'll choose some of the ahadith and we'll do the ahadith narrated by Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, inshallah. Any quick questions before we break? Yes, Dr. Mishra. The Banu Umayyah. Umayyah. Mm -hmm. So in Quraysh, it was no surprise that most politicians of Quraysh would come from Umayyah. But those outsiders had an issue with that. And I think that's one, one thing that they did not understand. The Excellent point. Had no problem with that. Excellent point. In fact, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions this in Minhaj al Sunnah. Uh, actually, it reminded me, I should have quoted this. Ibn Taymiyyah mentions this in Minhaj al Sunnah that of the reasons why Uthman appointed the Banu Umayyah is that the Banu Umayyah were the most experienced in siyasa. The Banu Umayyah were the most experienced in politics. And therefore, for Uthman to choose the Banu Umayyah, because they are in fact the seasoned politicians of the Quraysh, there's nothing wrong with that in the first place. As well, the rebels were not from the Quraysh. The people who killed Uthman were not from the Ansar and Muhajirun. They were from the outlying regions, primarily from Egypt, but also from Kufa and Basra. Okay, so these were not from the Sahaba at all. Uh, it is uh, authentically narrated that none of the Sahaba participated in the killing of Uthman. None of them. This was something that was from the riffraff and the new converts, not from the Sahaba. True, in the time of Ali, things happened between the Sahaba. That's going to come. But the beginning of the fitna was between Uthman and a group of nobodies. Okay, so that is also a valid point that it was not the Quraysh who were criticizing Uthman. They understood how status quo is. The main critics and all of the rebels were from these new uh, outlying regions, inshallah. Anything else before we conclude? Yes. So all these complaints, Did it come as a surprise? No. Some of these are uh, known for a long time, but now you have the main instigators from these cities physically coming. So again, we are jumping over a lot of sordid details. The fact of the matter is that Kufa is the prime example. They would always complain about something or other. There was always an issue that Uthman ibn Affan had. In fact, even in the time of Umar, the people of Kufa began to complain. And these were, you, if you read the books of history, the impression you get, these were very rowdy people. That it's like, you know, the outlying regions when America was being discovered and conquered and whatnot, and you had these, these towns that were being built and the settlers that are coming, there's no law and order. That's what Kufa is. It's an, a town that is formed as a conquering town. 
There was no city of Kufa before the Muslims created one for the outlying uh, basically posts. So Kufa, Basra, these are quite literally what the Americans would call frontier towns. And you know you've seen the black and white movies and whatnot, the lawlessness that takes place there. That's the image that, that we get when we read these things. So the people of these regions are the, 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 the outlying civilizations that have just nominally converted. Yes, you have Ibn Mas'ud and others that are in charge, but imagine the whole city. So the complaints that Uthman is receiving is nothing new. What is new, the people are now physically in Medina. After all of these years of complaining, the various cities have organized a joint rally against Uthman. And we'll get to the details of that inshallah next week about how did they get there and where were they camping and all of this inshallah. Uh, but what is clear is that the people of Egypt left and the people of Basra and Kufa heard of that and they wanted to join them. So they all joined up. Like a, huge a huge group. Yes, they all joined up. So now they're going to petition Uthman to get out of the Khilafah. That you're the cause of all of our problems and you get off and let us take charge. And that's not going to happen. You can, and remember, this is the first time this is happening. Abu Bakr and Umar, they didn't have this problem, right? The people felt if they pressured him enough, they could be given some authority. And Uthman would not cave in, nor would he allow, I'm jumping the gun here, nor would he allow the Sahaba to fight them. Because up until this point in time, no Muslim has fought another Muslim. That shall be Uthman's rallying call. I will not be the first to sheathe a sword against another Muslim. I will not be the first to spill the blood of another Muslim. He kept on saying this. I'm jumping to all of these details will come next week. He kept on saying this till the day that he died. When some of the Sahaba physically came to his house with armor and with their sword. And he said that I command you in the name of Allah who gave me power to go back to your house put your sword down, take your armor off. He forced the Sahaba to go back home because he did not want another Muslim to die or any Muslim to die in his Khilafah. And that's why the riffraff and the rebels managed to do what they did because he insisted to have no defense. Okay, inshaAllah ta'ala we will continue next uh, Wednesday and we'll talk about the actual death session of Uthman.